Ladies and gentlemen, oh, why art? Uh, this, of course, is an enormous and extraordinarily difficult subject, but I will begin by asking not merely why art, why science, why philosophy? Uh, I suppose the ultimate answer to these questions is uh, that human beings do seem to have a kind of uh, innate will to order, a kind of urge for imposing order and for finding meanings uh, in an otherwise incomprehensible world. And that in their different ways, uh, science, philosophy and art uh, help man to, uh, to impose this order, to look for this order, to impose it and to give meaning to what is otherwise a completely mysterious uh, uh, world in which he lives. Animals, <coughs> I presume, have no need of science and philosophy and art because the process of ordering has been done for them by their nervous systems. It is done in an extremely simple and very effective way their nervous system simply shut out uh, all elements in the world except those which are strictly necessary to them for biological survival. They live not in the wide, uh, enormous, mysterious universe that man lives in. They live in what may be called a tiny verse. Uh, the, the thing is so snug and... Uh, and uh, uh, tightly enclosed, that there really no problem arises and they don't have to uh, invent these uh, elaborate order-giving systems such as science and philosophy and art. Whereas man lives in a world so huge and so pro profuse and, um, and mysterious that he has to devise uh, these methods for uh, imposing order by means of symbolic systems. And of course science and philosophy in that various ways impose order in terms of uh, rational analysis, whereas art uh, imposes another kind of order um, in terms of beauty uh, embodied uh, in, in uh, significant forms of one kind or another. Well, in the most uh, general way, what are the criteria which we use in judging works of art uh, in terms of this idea of order and meaning? Well, uh, I suppose, it, uh, let us keep the, these, this matter on the most general level. We can criticize a work of art for having too little order the order is inadequate, the, the work of art is muddled, or else there may be too much order, too rigid an order, in which case that we feel that the work lacks spirit and vitality, or on the other hand, the order may be in some way extremely commonplace and boring, uh, or it may be awkward in some way, and in that case we feel that there is a certain vulgarity or an ugliness about the work. <coughs> and then in regard to, to meaning, the work of art may express a meaning which is either subtle or extremely obvious, uh, either realistic uh, or, or false, um, either noble or, or ignoble. And uh, all these uh, are, these distinctions constitute uh, adequate um, criteria of judgment. And then, of course, the, the order and the meaning may be imposed upon an, an experience uh, which may, on the one hand, uh, be shallow and narrow, and on the other hand, uh, may be profound and very wide. And I would think certainly that the greatest works of art are those created by, those, by men and women whose experience, uh, whose power of, of imposing 
aesthetic order is very great and whose experience is uh, wide and deep. And of course this wide and deep experience is essentially based upon uh, great capacities of sensitivity and sympathy. This, I think this, um, this question of sympathy, of being able to feel ourselves into the world around us is of immense importance to the artist. This has been expressed, uh, uh, for example, there's a very fine passage in Whitman where he says, um, whoever walks a furlong without sympathy walks to his own funeral dressed in his own shroud. And he says again, I am the man, I suffered, I was there. And as, uh, he identified himself with the the subjects he was writing about. And in a very different, uh, more classical tone, we find Matthew Arnold saying the same thing in The Strayed Reveller, <coughs> where he, uh, The Strayed Reveller, speaks about the, the gods and the poets, that they both uh, see the world with this, uh, this god's eye view uh, of um, uh, humanity at large, but whereas the gods do not identify with the world's suffering, the poet does, and the stray reveller concludes, such a price the gods exact for song to become what we sing. Now, uh, the function of the artist is to become what he sings and then to express by means of extremely penetrating and powerful symbols, uh, what he has experienced. Uh, needless to say, all experience is ultimately ineffable. We have, of course, concepts for everything, but they are finally quite inadequate to the experience itself. It is not only mystical experience, but even the most ordinary sens sensory experience is really ineffable. We have these uh, conventional words in which to describe it. And the essence of all poetry, of course, is in some way to to make the ineffable effable. By Instead of uh, trying to express the indescribable in rational terms, well, the poet goes about it in a circular way and so to speak, encloses this, uh, this void of ineffability with a network of symbols uh, whose uh, arrangement is such that, so to say, they take on their quality from the white spaces between the lines, from the, from the emptiness within the network. They, they in some way do create uh, a kind of a equivalent of uh, on symbolic uh, on a symbolic level of the experience which they express. And this is a very mysterious thing. It's extremely difficult to understand how it is that uh, art at its highest can somehow bypass the essential ineffability of experience and uh, create uh, the, a kind of experiential equivalent in terms of symbols. Nevertheless, however difficult and mysterious this process is, this is precisely uh, what, uh, uh, what happens, I think, when a work of art uh, on a great scale is created, that we do somehow make this equivalent of experience in terms of symbols. Well, now let us consider briefly uh, the relation, the importance of art in relation to ordinary life and society. Why art here? Well, I, I think one of the reasons of why art is that um, art is certainly one of the elements which helps to give a style to life. It may either give a good style or a bad style. And good artists, uh, I think... Uh, uh, really are uh, benefactors of society in as much as they, they help to 
improve the general style of living, because as Oscar Wilde remarked very truly that uh, art uh, doesn't so much imitate nature as nature imitates art. This is, is happens uh, again, and we see this happening again and again in the history uh, of societies, that they do, that people do take on in their practical living uh, the qualities suggested to them by their works of art. And in this sense, the <coughs> aesthetic shortcomings uh, may be regarded almost uh, as moral delinquencies. There is a certain justice uh, in the praise which the crowd uh, cries out in um, Julius Caesar, tear him for his bad verses. They haven't got the right reason there, but there probably are quite good reasons for tearing people for their bad verses, because they do, by producing bad works of art, lower the general style of living. I, I think it would be quite untrue to say that the, the work of art is the only factor determining the general style of living within a society, but it is undoubtedly uh, one of the, um, uh, of the factors, and as such it has, I think, a great uh, uh, social importance. And now, <coughs> briefly, I would like to, to make a digression on another of the functions of art, which is the cathartic function, the therapeutic function. Now, art, it seems to me, has two functions. Uh, one is communicative, where a person of great talent uh, communicates through his power to create expressive symbols, communicates uh, insights which his special talents permit him to have, uh, communicates qualities within this uh, experience of his, which his powers of sensitivity and sympathy uh, allow him to uh, have within himself and to give out. Uh, this is one of the functions of art. And the other function uh, is a, a cathartic and therapeutic function, and many of the great artists, have, of course, have often spoken of this cathartic function of art. They have spoken of the way in which the uh, artistic expression uh, does permit the release of tension within the, within the artist himself uh, and the getting rid of all kinds of painful emotions. And this is the second function of art. Now, <coughs> I would say that practically everybody would be well advised to practice art for its therapeutic values. Uh, the sort of do-it-yourself painters, the Sunday painters, the, the uh, um, ceramic workers and so on, they are undoubtedly doing something which is extremely good for themselves, uh, in uh, getting rid of all kinds of internal troubles in this way. But I think the point which has to be stressed is this, which I think one has to emphasize to all Sunday painters, that although my painting a picture may do me a lot of good, your looking at my picture may not do you any good. <laughs> uh, in fact, it may give you a severe pain and, uh, and make you feel rather seasick. And for this reason, I think one should always advise the, the Sunday painter to confine himself to therapy and not to exhibit. <laughs> uh, leave the exhibition of paintings to those who can communicate and who have something to communicate. Unhappily, the world is so unjustly arranged that there are relatively few people who have very much to communicate, uh, and above all, who have this very strange uh, talent for using symbols in such a way that communication can take place. And now, let's consider some of the forms of art. And here, I think it's worth uh, drawing an analogy between uh, the arts and the sciences. Uh, in the history of science, we see two methods of thinking about the, the world, uh, two types of methodology. There is the atomistic method, first of all, the method of analyzing things down into their 
constituent uh, parts and elements. <coughs> and this is represented in classical antiquity by um, Democritus. Uh, and then we see it uh, revived in the uh, period of modern science with Galileo and Newton and uh, in modern days by the contemporary physicists and chemists. This is the, the analytical method, which of course has been immensely fruitful. But there is also another way of looking at the world, which is the, <coughs> the method of seeing not the component elements, but the general forms or gestalts within nature. And uh, this is represented in antiquity by such thinkers as Plato and Aristotle, and uh, in modern times by the comparative anatomists, by the morphologists. Incidentally, the word was invented by a poet, by Goethe, in the morphology, uh, and um, by the uh, students of growth, by Gestalt psychologists, and so on. And this is a, uh, a legitimate, and we discover, an extremely fruitful <coughs> way of looking at the, at the world. Now, in general, it may be said that, um, that art uh, has pursued the second method more than the first. You see, it has been generally a search for forms within the natural world and an, an imposition of forms to make the uh, explanation and the comprehension of the world more clear we have, as I say, not only looked for forms, but we have also, in art, imposed forms upon uh, our experience. But there has, I, I think it's true to say, there has also been a considerable experiment, particularly in modern times, with what may be called atomistic uh, art. Uh, in the world of the novel, for example, we see atomistic novels uh, represented by such works as uh, Lawrence's Women in Love, the novels of Dorothy Richardson, uh, of James Joyce. Uh, all these uh, are, so to say, atomistic narratives carried on rather like the, uh, w in the world of physics, of atomic physics, which, goes, uh, which uh, considers reality below the level of qualities. So these atomistic novels consider human beings, so to say, below the level of character. In the same way, we find uh, in, uh, in contemporary music such uh, uh, composers as Boulez, who are writing music which, so to say, is below the level of melody. And in painting, we see uh, phenomena like, uh, such as um, Jackson Pollock, who is painting below the level of geometry. Uh, very much as the uh, atomic physicist works uh, on nature below the level of qualities. Uh, and in general, however, I think the art has more often uh, pursued the forms, uh, the gestalts within nature, and as I say, has tried to impose its own uh, system of forms uh, upon the world. Well, of course, there are quite clearly two types of art. There's the type of art, uh, pictorial and plastic arts, which deal with space. And then there are the um, other arts whose uh, fundamental medium is time, uh, uh, the, uh, the art of music, poetry, of drama, of n narration. Uh, these are temporal arts, and the others are spatial arts. And uh, within the uh, spatial arts, of course, the, the fundamental uh, forms, the fundamental uh, types of arrangement are, have to do with um, symmetry and asymmetry. And it's, um, it's interesting here to, to look at the, the way in which, I think it's true to say that uh, this, the arts which deal with space have borrowed a number of their significant symbols from the world of nature. Uh, for example, <coughs> if we look at the world of nature, we find uh, that um, everything which we regard as living and dynamic, I mean, the typical 
animal, from the insect up to the, uh, to the mammal, is uh, bilaterally sy symmetrical, but asymmetrical fore and aft. In other words, it has a head and a tail, and its, uh, its legs on each side are much the same. Uh, and this, uh, this sort of one-pointed symbol, this arrow-like shape, is, uh, uh, I think one will find in all uh, uh, pictorial forms, that this is a very powerful dynamic symbol. Uh, it, uh, whereas the, the uh, circular symmetry, radial symmetry, is found only in plants and in sessile or free-floating forms. It is not found in forms of animal life which, uh, which move of their own volition. It is found, as I say, only in those which are attached to the earth or which float about in water, or also in plants which uh, do not move in the same way as animals move. And I think this... Uh, uh, this fact, this profound uh, and obvious natural fact, is perhaps what accounts for the uh, feeling that we have about the curved form and the pointed form. I mean, we certainly get, as we look at Romanesque ar architecture with its rounded arches, a sense of repose and the domes and so on. And from the Gothic architecture, which is uh, with its um, one-pointed... Uh, drive upwards uh, this sense of uh, dynamic power uh, and I think one could probably with a little ingenuity find many other examples of uh, uh, symbols which have been taken from natural objects and incorporated into the symbol vocabulary which artists have used well then within the, uh, the temporal arts uh, we find also a certain taking over of uh, the natural um, forms uh, of, um, of rhythm within the world. I mean, w we are perfectly familiar, of course, with these, uh, these temporal natural rhythms. There are the astronomical rhythms, night and day, the circles of the moon, the coming and going of the seasons, the cycles of vegetation, and so on. And it's interesting to note, too, that man has found it necessary to add to these natural divisions of what Whitehead calls perpetual perishing of the, of the continual flux of time. He's found it necessary to supplement these natural divisions with artificial divisions of his own. He has imposed the week upon the month, he has imposed the, he has imposed uh, church holidays, national holidays, and so on. Uh, anything in which to uh, to break up the uh, the rather terrifying fact of this continual flux of time, to make it seem in some way space-like, and to uh, to give it this. Uh, even in the process of living it, to give it a certain artistic form. Well, I, I think it's, it's clear that analogues of, this, uh, of these natural forms uh, of, uh, of time divisions have been taken over in the various uh, temporal arts. I mean, we see the, the, um, uh, of the various types of rhythm within music, the, the, the curves, uh, broken curves, or uh, curves of uh, circles of repetition going on within both music and poetry and the drama and narration. And uh, there have been, I would say, quite definitely uh, borrowings uh, of the fundamental forms uh, out of nature into art. We, I mean, we see this curious an interesting fact that the, uh, we impose uh, our symbols upon nature but borrow the shape of them in many cases from, uh, from nature. We take something, turn it into a symbol and uh, give it back to nature. 
And a, a problem, of course, arises here in relation to certain types of, uh, of advanced modern art. For example, I've mentioned uh, the music of Boulez just now, and one wonders very much whether a music which um, has so completely transcended and got beyond the ordinary natural rhythms, the rhythms of the heartbeat, the rhythms of respiration and so on, whether such a music, uh, however interesting it may be, can create, uh, form the basis of a new style, whether we do not, whether we are not compelled by the very nature of our being uh, to um, conform more than uh, certainly some uh, very advanced forms of modern art do uh, to the, uh, the natural rhythms within us. I, I would guess that the, these uh, experiments which see, seem to betray an extraordinary kind of impatience as though it were impossible to, uh, to spend uh, so much time as is required in listening to, the, to a music in which the natural rhythms uh, occur. Um, whether such a music so telescoped and so, uh, so short, so reduced to a kind of shorthand, can form the basis of a, a flowering, developing musical style. I don't know. I have a, a strong feeling that it, it will be found to be almost impossible to, to keep this going as, a, uh, as the basis of a, of a new music. But I, of course, I may be entirely wrong. <coughs> now, uh, let us now pass, uh, I'm afraid this, this lecture is rather incoherent because I have to talk about such an immense number of things, but I would like to talk very briefly about the creative act. Uh, what does the artist do when he prepares himself uh, to make a work of art? Well, I, I think in the most general terms, what he does is to concentrate his mind upon some piece of subject matter and then open himself up uh, to whatever may come into his, what I have called in an earlier lecture, his positive subconscious, uh, in relation to this subject. There will be the, uh, the sort of conscious mind is pursuing a given theme but the unconscious is providing all kinds of material. It may be associations out of his own la past life. It may be scraps of knowledge, historical knowledge, scientific knowledge, philosophic knowledge, which come in. It may be, in fact, anything which the, is stored up in this immense uh, magazine of the, uh, of the um, unconscious mind. And uh, the... Uh, again, I think it's quite clear that the greatest artists have been extraordinarily fortunate in being able to tap an immense reservoir of such material and then to be able to organize it in uh, efficiently, uh, aesthetically satisfying forms. Uh, and the organizing process is, of course, the, what we vaguely call uh, the imagination. And I would like here to quote a very famous passage from Coleridge on the nature of the imagination, which I, to this day remains one of the best uh, accounts of, of what this strange faculty in man is able to do. Uh, what he says is this, imagination is the power which reveals itself in the balance or re reconcilement of opposite or discordant qualities, of sameness with difference, of the general with the concrete, of the idea with the image, of the sense of novelty and freshness with old and familiar objects. Now, this I think is, uh, is a profound and extremely uh, um, apposite description of this process of bringing together all this disparate and uh, mutually uh, mutually inconsequential material uh, and 
forming it into um, a, a single whole within the, the work of art. And of course, on the uh, small scale, uh, this process of the imagination of bringing uh, these mutually relevant uh, factors together uh, into a single harmony is brilliantly illustrated in poetic metaphor. Uh, it's worth, I think, in this context, quoting a few vivid metaphors which bring together the most absurdly remote uh, um, factors and form them into a single powerfully uh, suggestive unit. Uh, for example, in the sleep that knits up the raveled sleeve of thought, well, here you see you have a, uh, you combine the idea of embroidery wool or, or silk with the idea of sleep and the, uh, and the workings of the uh, troubled mind. Or you have the uh, metaphor like uh, uh, in the beginning of, uh, of the Tempest, the strongest oaths are straw to the fire in the blood. Uh, the extremely powerful metaphor. Or the, the, the other very bitter and, uh, and savage metaphor describing the violence of desire where he says, and those milk paps but through the window bars bore at men's eyes. The, this whole sense of the, um, the, the breasts are like gimlets boring into the, uh, into the mind of the man filled with desire. And um, then let's hear, quote another one from, uh, uh, from Gerald Manley Hopkins, uh, talking about uh, human nature. And um, here he the art of the baker is brought into a connection with the idea of sin and the soul, where he says, uh, self-yeast of spirit, a dull dough sours. An extremely powerful metaphor. And, <coughs> and then, of course, there's the famous metaphor in Keats, I cannot see what flowers are at my feet, nor what soft incense hangs upon the boughs. And uh, in conclusion, I would like to quote this very extraordinary uh, sonnet of George Herbert's uh, on prayer, which is a, a long catena of, of metaphors, a very, very strange poem. Prayer, the church's banquet, angel's age, God's breath in man returning to its birth, the soul in, in, uh, the soul in paraphrase, heart in pilgrimage, the Christian plummet sounding heaven and earth, engine against the almighty, sinner's tower, reversed thunder, Christ's side piercing spear, the six days world transposing in an hour, a kind of tune which all things hear and fear, softness and peace and joy and love and bliss, Exalted manner, gladness at the best, heaven in ordinary, man well dressed, the Milky Way, the bird of paradise, church bells beyond the stars heard, the soul's blood, the land of spices, something understood. Uh, and when one reads a, a piece like this, I, one does realize the extraordinary power of the imagination, this bringing together of mutually relevant elements into a, a new and, uh, and powerfully moving set of symbols. Well, of course, on the, uh, the, this is, as I say, the working of imagination, the reconcilement of opposites and discordances on the smallest level, but of course on the large level we see the same thing. Uh, we, we see um, any great work of art uh, is essentially the bringing together of many disparate elements and forming them into a harmonious whole. And here, I think, we can speak about something which to me is very significant, the idea of the hierarchy of perfections. Many works of art 
are perfect in their way, but there, I, I think it's true to say that there is a real hierarchy of perfections, that there, some perfections are greater and more significant than others. <coughs> uh, for example, the perfection of uh, a haiku, a Japanese haiku, or um, a sonnet, or a Shakespeare song, is not the same, not the equivalent, I would say, as the perfection of a great drama, um, Full Fathom Five, is not on the same level, although it is perfect in its way, is a perfection inferior to the perfection, say, of, of um, Hamlet or Macbeth. Uh, that, uh, I think one can generalize here and say that uh, uh, those works of art are the greatest and most significant, which do harmonize uh, within uh, a single harmonious system uh, the greatest number of significant factors in human living that you can have a perfection which harmonizes very few factors, I mean, may harmonize only certain aesthetic factors, I mean, which you may have, for example, in the perfection of a, of a sung bowl. This is a real perfection. But I would feel certainly that this perfection is not the equal of the perfection of the best sung landscapes, which harmonize many more elements of our experience elements of our awareness of the external world, and elements, too, of uh, an awareness of the inner world. For these, uh, these great Sung landscapes are, in a certain sense, among the greatest religious paintings of all times. They, they, they do express uh, a, the ki a kind of mystical aspect of the human mind in, a, in a, an extremely powerful way. And in general, I, I think this is one of the bases of the distinction uh, between the, what is uh, traditionally known as the fine arts and the arts and crafts, that the, there is, of course, an element of snobbery in this distinction, uh, that the, the craftsman was regarded as a person of inferior rank to the great painter, but uh, there is also, I would think, a, a real, <coughs> uh, a real a, a true evaluation here, that I would think that the great uh, complex work of art, other things being equal, if, if it has an equal degree of perfection, uh, is a greater work than the, than the perfect uh, the sung bowl or the perfect carpet or, or what not. Uh, and um, this, I ha hate to say so, uh, but uh, it seems to me that this distinction may apply even to a good deal of, uh, of um, non-objective painting. Uh, uh, much of this, I, I do think, is very beautiful and uh, it achieves a kind of perfection, but it does seem to me a limited perfection compared with the perfection, for example, of, uh, of the great masterpieces of, uh, uh, of pictorial art. I mean, the nativity of Piero, the Doste Mayo of, uh, of Goya and so on. I mean, these harmonized in a single completely aesthetically satisfying whole, such an immensely much greater number of important aspects of human experience, both aesthetic on and uh, uh, emotional, intellectual, and spiritual, that I would, without any hesitation, think that the, uh, these... Uh, works, however perfect they may be, uh, are essentially minor works of art, and that the, the, the great perfections require a more comprehensive uh, uh, taking in of experience. And incidentally, I think there's a great deal to be said for the fact that uh, if you do have elaborate 
uh, compositions illustrating, for example, a scene in the Bible or, or in Greek mythology, uh, you have opportunities of creating purely aesthetic values much greater than if you are confining yourself to purely non-objective uh, uh, elements. Uh, for example, I mean, <clears throat> take a picture which uh, I happen to like very much, a picture by Botticelli called the um, uh, Calumny of Apelles, a very, very odd picture indeed. Uh, one generally, if one looks at it, one doesn't know what on earth it's about. I actually took the trouble once to look it up in one of the dialogues of Lucian, where the subject matter of this picture is described. And I found that this picture of Botticelli is, among other things, an extremely good and accurate illustration of this story out of Lucian. Well, what, uh, the story is not of great importance, but it, it is very important aesthetically in as much as the necessity of drawing, a gr of painting a great many figures, one of whom is naked, the other clothed, within an architectural background, called upon, uh, made it necessary for Botticelli uh, to organize the purely aesthetic and formal and coloristic uh, uh, elements in his picture, uh, it made it necessary for him to bring in an immense number of these elements and to organize them into an incredibly complicated uh, composition, which I don't think any uh, merely non-representational composition, however elaborate, could ever have approached. I mean, I don't think the, uh, the human mind is so constructed that it can produce anything quite as complex uh, aesthetically uh, or quite as satisfactory as the representation of uh, a complex uh, uh, scene in the outside world. <coughs> uh, now, uh, very briefly, let's talk about uh, different kinds of art. Obviously, what we have learned in recent times is to tolerate and to like very many different kinds of art. Uh, 200 years ago, everything was extremely simple because there was only one kind of art which any civilized person in the Western world could uh, admit to be art, and that was uh, Greco-Roman Renaissance art and its uh, successors. Well, now, uh, everything else, of course, was condemned and thought to be ridiculous uh, and that uh, all other forms of art were regarded as merely as inept efforts to, to realize the kind of perfection realized, uh, uh, created by the Greco-Roman and Renaissance artists. Well, now we, uh, uh, we have an immensely much greater knowledge than our parents had. We have photography which is placed at our disposal reproductions of, uh, of every kind of work of art. Uh, even in my own lifetime, it's incredible the, what has been opened up. When I was a boy, there was no such thing as Sumerian art or as Minoan art. These things were quite unknown. Uh, uh, Mayan art was virtually unknown. Very little was known about the Incas. Nothing virtually was known about the Africans or the Polynesians. Now all this has entered into our knowledge, into our sphere of, of, uh, of understanding, <coughs> and we realize quite clearly uh, that uh, all, all these methods of looking at the world are perfectly legitimate, and that there are means of achieving perfection within each of these methods. And I think this is, in one sense, an immense gain for us, in another sense, it poses great difficulties because in the time when there was only one legitimate art, people were not distracted at all from it. I mean, they knew there was only one way of doing a thing and they threw aside everything else. And consequently, they were able, for example, with the elements of uh, Greek or Roman architecture to go on exploring the possibilities of the style from the late 15th century to the middle of the 19th 
uh, and it's incredible what a lot they got out of it simply by concentrating on this one thing. Today we know such an immense amount that it seems very difficult for, for any body to concentrate for as long uh, as was done in the past on any single one style. And perhaps this is a, a kind of disadvantage on, uh, from which we suffer. We have what the French call uh, embarras de richesse. We, we are embarrassed by our own wealth. And uh, it may be that uh, in certain respects our more ignorant fathers were better off uh, uh, than we are. <coughs> But uh, uh, for the rest of us, I think, except for uh, practicing uh, examples, uh, except for practicing artists, I think we, we are all incomparably better off for this immensely wider range of knowledge uh, which uh, is at our disposal. Uh, I would add to the, uh, to the discoveries within my own lifetime uh, one of the great discoveries, of course, has been the discovery of Paleolithic art, the earliest where uh, discoveries were made before I was born. But uh, many of the, the greatest discoveries have come out within the quite recent years. And, uh, and we realize that here again, even among these extraordinarily primitive people, there were perfections. I mean, anybody who's seen the cave paintings at Lascaux in south central France um, must have been overcome with the extraordinary power of these things. And uh, it also raises the most interesting psychological problems. I mean, when we compare the, the nature of these extremely naturalistic paintings, which seem to have been based upon a capacity for eidetic imagery, when we compare these with the completely conceptualized paintings of Neolithic times, which in their own way are also extremely perfect, we realize what an immense uh, spectrum the world of art can, can cover. I mean, it can cover, as I say, at one end, uh, uh, the art based upon eidetic imagery, uh, perhaps uh, uh, created by people in, with whom language hadn't been much developed yet. I mean, perhaps this was why they were able to, to think in such non-conceptual terms. Uh, the other, at the other end of the scale, we find the Neolithic art, which is so completely conceptualized that it looks as though men were suddenly reveling in the discovery of language and were projecting onto his uh, painted surfaces the, these wonderful new verbal ideas which he, he was able to use in uh, uh, which had given new sense to the world but, uh, and it does show very clearly to what over what an enormous uh, gamut this um, uh, this um, extraordinary uh, activity of art can spread <coughs> Now, we finally come to the most difficult problem of all, the problem of music. Well, why on earth does uh, music uh, affect us as it does? This is a very mysterious thing because the, uh, unlike the uh, literary or, or plastic and pictorial arts, the symbols, the sound symbols of music, they do not represent anything in the external world. They, they do not have a conventional meaning such as words have. Uh, they don't, they are not onomatopoeic. They, they don't uh, uh, correspond at all closely. I mean, the general rhythms may be analogous to the natural rhythms, but uh, they don't. There is nothing which uh, makes music strictly comparable to, to literature or to the pictorial and plastic arts. Uh, nevertheless, I don't think anybody can doubt that uh, music has a profound meaning. But what that meaning is, is very difficult to say. It certainly isn't the meaning which is on the program notes. Uh, these... Uh, 
I mean, to start with, every program annotator says something different. I mean, says this work was made by Beethoven's heart was breaking for somebody or other. The next one says that this is a work of overpowering gaiety or something of the kind. And, uh, uh, but nevertheless, this, uh, this meaning is there uh, and is of um, profound importance. It is worthwhile uh, in this context uh, to see, to listen to what uh, great musicians have thought about what they were doing. Um, what did Beethoven, for example, think that music was about? Um, Beethoven's writing is unsatisfactory. I mean, his power of expression was entirely within the realm of music. His letters on the whole, I think, are rather disappointing as letters. And uh, his, uh, when he wanted to express it himself, he just had to write music. Consequently, what he has to say about music is, in a sense, rather banal, and yet it, uh, I think it has very great importance. Uh, like many other composers, he, he seems to think that, uh, that music has a cognitive aspect, that uh, through music uh, that it was possible for man to come to a special kind of knowledge of the universe, something like the mystic's obscure knowledge, uh, knowledge of the totali totality of, of being. And what he says is this, music is the sole incorporeal uh, entrance into the higher scale of knowledge which comprehends mankind. It gives prophetic vision and heavenly wisdom. Well, this, of course, is, is these are gay, as I say, rather banal and not very significant phrases. But I do think this whole idea of the cognitive value of music, and indeed of, of all art, is probably very important. That, uh, in a certain sense, art, as I say, is something which imposes forms upon the uh, flux of reality. Uh, gives it meaning, but in a certain sense it is also discovering, not merely forms, but discovering uh, that which, uh, so to say, lies behind the forms. That uh, there is a sense, I think, in which, uh, and this after all is uh, profoundly important in the ideas of Plato, that the, uh, in beauty we do discover something about the nature of the world, that this in some way or other, in an entirely ineffable and inexplicable way, beauty is built into the fundamental nature of things, and that art is a method of discovering this. And music, above all, with its strange capacity for discovering a sort of pure incorporeal <laughs> dynamic essence of, uh, uh, of life it does perhaps give the, uh, provide the most um, powerful weapon for exploring this, uh, the, the one aspect at least of the ultimate nature of the world. And I would like to to finish with this idea, it is, uh, I'm afraid, extremely vague because I don't understand it myself. <coughs> um, but I do feel very strongly that uh, this uh, Beethoven's idea of the cognitive value of music and indeed of art in general uh, is a, a, a real thing. And that, uh, as I say, that we do not uh, merely impose forms upon the world, we discover them within the world, and we also discover that which lies beyond form, and that which is the ultimate uh, source of all form, which, uh, as so to say, the creative principle uh, at the upstream from all particular manifestations. <coughs>